Hello everyone. Recently I became interested in the topic of transmitting digital video signals with minimal latency over the air. Until recently, drone pilots used analog video communication to control them from a first-person perspective. The standard in analog transmission was considered to be the PAL and NTSC systems. Their video quality is as outdated as the systems themselves. Since 2019, digital video systems such as DJI F1 have appeared on the market. FPV and Fatshock Bifrost, which later became known as HD0. In 2022, a third competitor emerged with the Valksni Avatar goggles. But before their appearance, there existed and still exists an open source video system called Wi-Fi Broadcast. It is built on two single board computers and connected Wi-Fi modules, capable of operating in monitor mode. One system was installed on the aircraft and a second one on the ground. The monitor mode allowed for sending and receiving data without initializing the Wi-Fi network. For example, if the Wi-Fi network loses connection, reconnection procedures begin, which take a lot of time. In monitor mode, this procedure is not required. Packets continue to be sent and the receiving part gets them if possible. Subsequently, this idea was picked up by other developers who created the OpenHD project. The Wi-Fi broadcast code was rewritten in C++ with the intention of reducing latency. The claim was successful, but the test data is not provided on the project's website. Due to their popularity, the prices of Raspberry Pi single board computers have skyrocketed and our Russian guys found a way out. Use Chinese IP surveillance cameras as the air station. The cost is up to 10 times less than that of Raspberry Pi. After researching the issue, it turned out that most cameras are mini computers designed for working with video streams. They have a chip on board for encoding video streams in H.264 and the more modern H.265 codec. The community of block reprogramming such cameras is called OpenIPC. I contacted their engineers and they suggested I start studying the topic with the GK7205 V200 IP camera and purchase a Wi-Fi adapter based on the RTL8812 chip. Let's take a look at the specifications. A 32-bit processor, a 2 megapixel sensor, with a 1 to 2.8 inch IMAX 307, which I believe is a sensor from Sony, hardware encoders H.264, H.265, and MGPEG, with a bitrate of up to 8 megabits per second, a 100 megabit network port, and a USB 2.0 port. Later, I found the datasheet for the GK7205 V200 chip, and it turned out to be a copy of another Chinese chip, the HiSilicon 35116E V200. Opening its datasheet, it features an ARM Cortex-A7 processor with a frequency of 900 MHz, claiming multi-threaded real-time video encoding at full HD resolution at 30 frames per second, plus a substream of 576p, also at 30 frames per second. So, on the table are the main components, the camera, a 28mm lens for it, a heatsink for cooling the processor, and a cable for power connection, and a network cable for a 100 megabit per second network. Let's take a closer look at the board. On one side we have the processor, and on the other side is the sensor itself. Look how small it is. I suggest we attach the lens and connect the cable, and I am attaching the lens. The lens had protrusions here, so I had to bite them off. For experiments with the camera, I bought a special cable. One connector is for a 12 volt power supply and the other connector is for connecting to the internet network. As it turned out, such cables can come in different colors. I tested the wire and obtained the following connection diagram. I leave the first contact empty. The purple wire is my indicator for the local network LED. There is a small LED on the wire and it will blink when the network is working. Next are the white, blue, blue, white, green and green wires. These are directly for the local network and two wires for power supply. The black wire 
is ground, and the red wire is the positive contact. There are also a few free wires left. This is a 5 volt wire, which is parallel to other wires of the same color, red and black. And as I was explained, this contact usually goes to the power supply of the camera's illumination. However, since this is an IP camera for video surveillance, it usually has LED lighting. There are two more wires, yellow and gray, which are for connecting power over the network, known as PoE. But this camera lacks the necessary module, so these wires remain hanging in the air. Looking from this side of the connector, it goes 1, white, blue, blue, then white green, then skips 2, and goes green. The previous two are for PoE, the positive bus, and the last two are for the negative bus. These contacts are parallel. I connected the camera directly to the computer and now want to see what latency the camera provides out of the box. For this, I will use a stopwatch on my phone. I started the stopwatch and aimed the camera at the monitor. And if I pause it, I can count the time difference. The latency is around 100 to 150 milliseconds. For latency experiments, I made a special device where the camera lens is inserted and aimed at the screen. The indicator shows the latency time in milliseconds. All measurements were made with the following settings. Codec, AR265, Full HD resolution, 30 frames per second, constant bit rate of 2626 kbps. The additional stream is off. Now I want to make one more measurement. This is on. Codec 264. In Chinese it is called 265x. And to achieve the maximum bitrate, I am saving it. It won't be needed for comparison with the reprogrammed device. Every complex device usually has a debugging URT port. Technicians connect to this port and can diagnose the device. I find the technical URT port on the camera and connect to the TTL adapter using the RXTX cross connection and ground. I set the jumper on the TTL adapter to 3.3 volts. I connect the TTL adapter to the computer, launch the terminal and power on the device. After that, I download the necessary software, flash it, and a full Linux operating system appears on the camera board. During the flashing process, there were nuances with removing the protection from the flash memory. I will make a separate video with more details, so subscribe to not miss it. I will use the Asus AC56 USB Wi-Fi adapter as a transmitter and receiver. I found two of them on a Vito for 1000 rubles each. Any other adapter with the RTL8812AU chip can be used. The complete list of compatible adapters can also be viewed on the OpenHD website. To open the case, I gently pry it from this corner and from the second corner. I then very carefully and gently use a screwdriver to unclip it. And there is a small but important tab that I press with precision and care while gently pulling it out. The adapter contains a network chip model, RTL8812AU, specifically, and it includes two powerful amplifiers for five GHS. There are also two internal antennas and two external ones. The first is for a screw connection, and the second is for a connector that can be brought outside from the other side with unclear markings. There are two amplifiers for 2 and 4 gigahertz. Let's take a look at the data sheet for the network controller and signal amplifiers. Here, the standard 802.11 as MIMO is stated. This is Wi-Fi of the fifth generation, operating at frequencies of 2, 4 and 5 gigahertz. It also supports three channels from 20 to 80 megahertz, allowing for a transmission speed of up to 800.5 megabits per second. I want to note that the wider the bandwidth, the shorter the transmission distance. There are also various modulation methods available. For our purposes we will use these two, 
as other modulation methods significantly reduce the distance over which the signal can be transmitted. Here is the schematic diagram for connecting the microcontroller. As we can see, there is an input USB interface and two radio outputs. There is also MIMO technology, which enhances reception reliability and increases bandwidth. Now let's open the datasheet for the C523L amplifier. As can be seen, the linear output power is plus 19 decibels for 256 quadrature amplitude modulation. Agree, that's quite a lot. The principal circuit for connecting the amplifier has also been defined. Let's take a look at two more data sheets for the amplifier that comes with other Wi-Fi adapters, such as C523LE. This is a 16 dB amplifier and a more powerful C523L, an amplifier with plus 26 dB. At 256 quadrature modulation, it provides plus 24 dB. It turns out that this amplifier significantly outperforms the amplifier that is on the ISOS adapter. Now let's connect the Wi-Fi adapter to the camera. To avoid damaging the Wi-Fi adapter, I will use the USB port. Here, I have already soldered the wires according to the pinout. I soldered the shielding here. The white wire goes here, the green one goes here. I soldered the black wire to the ground wire, but it can also be soldered to the shielding. I soldered the red wire to the 5 volt back from Matek. This is because the 5 volt stabilizer on the camera does not draw a large current from the adapter. The power for the BC comes from 12 volts. I soldered the wires in this area. I supply 12 volts of power using the command LUS and USB, checking that a new device has appeared. Here it is, and using the command if config, we see that this device has appeared in the list of network devices named VLAN0. This indicates the successful connection of our USB adapter to the IP camera. We move on to the next stage. As a ground station, I will temporarily use my personal computer based on the AMD Ryzen 5 processor with an external GTX 1060 graphics card. This is a temporary option because a single board computer Orange P5 is already on its way to me. By the way, for the ground station, you can use almost any old laptop or single board computer that supports hardware video decoding in the H.254 or H.250 codec. I installed the Ambien Linux operating system on the SD card. Now we need to install the drivers for our RTL882AU chip and the Wi-Fi NG application. To install the driver, I clone the source files from the GitHub repository. I navigate to the repository folder. Next, I install DKMS and run the script from the repository to compile and install the drivers. Next, I go to the WFBNG project page, also copy the repository, and perform the compilation and installation. Using the command if config, I find out the name of our Wi-Fi adapter in the system. After that, I run the installation script, specifying the name of the adapter as a parameter. It is necessary to run it with administrative rights. Then we go have tea, not forgetting to eat something. Everything is set up. Now we copy the secret key from the camera to the ground station. I created a simple script to configure the Wi-Fi adapter. I based it on a script from Rx in standalone, copied the template from there and added my own lines to unlock RFQ. I set the MTU to 1500 and the frequency channel to 161. Next, I identify the name of the Wi-Fi adapter in the system and run the script. I specify the name of the adapter as a parameter. An access error occurred because it needs to be run with administrator rights. The settings have been applied and now the receiving part of the Wi-Fi broadcast can be launched. The console shows that data has started to be transmitted. Now I open the second terminal and start the program for decoding streaming video. The program is called GStreamer. A program window has appeared and now I will remove the protective cover from the camera. Hooray! The system is working. Here is my home aquarium. Fish appear there only at night. Let's evaluate the delay and quality of the video. To do this, I took Mr. Styles' video 
and passed it through the created Wi-Fi broadcast system. On the right side of the screen, encoding is done in H.264 format with a frame size of 720p and 45 frames per second. The difference is only in the bit rate. The top is 4 megabits per second, the bottom is 8 megabits. And in the bottom left, I added another video encoded in H.265 Full HD at 30 frames per second with a bit rate of 8 megabits. Let's go. Just look at how tightly this guy flies. What a reaction. This isn't Mr. Seal, it's some Muhammad. Well, let's be serious. Now at the end of the tunnel, a window will appear. Let's see how many frames it takes to display on the other screens. 4 HD, it is 2 frames, and for Full HD, it is 3 frames. Since this video plays at a speed of 25 frames per second, which is 40 milliseconds per frame, it turns out that the delay for HD is... The delay is approximately 80 milliseconds for Full HD, and 120 milliseconds for other settings. It was found that the main delay occurs during video encoding and decoding, while the delay over the radio channel is about 4 milliseconds. I want to note that different frame rates will have different inter-frame delays. For example, at 45 FPS, it is 22 milliseconds, and at 120 FPS, it is already 8 milliseconds, resulting in a difference of 14 milliseconds. It turns out that it is necessary to increase the FPS and the speed of video encoding and decoding. Now let's look at the quality of the video stream encoding. The 720p image has a crop so the field of view is slightly smaller. I had to move the camera closer to the monitor so that the image would be approximately the same size. Cropping is needed to increase the frame rate to 45 FPS. This is due to the limited hardware capabilities of the camera. There is blurring at the edges of the camera, likely caused by the lens. As for the image quality, the camera oversaturates the colors. For example, look at the green color. In the original video, it is not as vibrant the difference between 4 and 8 megabits is not very noticeable to the eye. Only when the video is stopped can one notice that the contours of the objects are sharper in the stream with a higher bitrate. The same applies to video encoding in H.264 and H.265. The difference in quality between the video streams is small. In other conditions, the 265 codec might show its superiority. No, the guy is really good at what he does. He performs such tricks and is not afraid of crashing. I wonder how long he has been learning this. Yeah, the guy is awesome. That's it. He's landing. What conclusions can be drawn? The FPV system, using EPI cameras, works and does so very well. According to the guys, they flew 20 kilometers using ASUS Wi-Fi modules but I will only be able to verify this after the flight restrictions in our region are lifted. The image quality is satisfactory and limited by the hardware encoding bitrate of 8 MBPs. If you take an EPI camera with a more powerful processor, you can try encoding at T2050 MBPs. However, at such speeds, the data transmission distance is significantly reduced as it is necessary to use signal modulation that is less resistant to scales and interference. Latency the average latency in my experiments was 130 milliseconds. The minimum value was 80 milliseconds, but that was under ideal conditions. This is the cheapest FPV system for the 2023 year. If it weren't for the 130 milliseconds of latency, it would be a direct competitor to commercial FPV systems, and it will become one soon, but I won't reveal all the details right now. Bombastic comments, likes and subscriptions are welcome. All links are in the description. Goodbye everyone.